Ruth chapter 3, we, our text this morning will be looking at verses 7 through 11. We are, our series is we're looking at the hall of faith. We're looking at men and women of God and, from the scriptures that uh, inspire us, that we can glean from and learn from, from their life, from their example, from their faith, so that we can realize that we can do great exploits for God, just as, as they did. Um, through this hall of faith, we recognize that these men and women are not cut from a different cloth than we are. They're, they're flesh and blood, just like we are, prone to doubt, prone to fear. Um, all of the things that we struggle with, they struggled with. And, uh, but yet, because of their faith, uh, they inspire us, that we can hopefully, through our faith, inspire those around us. Um, and that we can inspire the next generation of, what it, of, of believers and what it looks like to follow Christ. So this morning, let us look at our next member into the hall of faith, and it is Ruth. Ruth is a woman who left her home and her culture for the God of her in-laws. This really speaks a lot of, of her in-laws, right? Anybody love your in-laws? Everybody should, yes, yes, we all love our in-laws, right? They're good people. But would you, would you leave everything that is normal to you, everything that, is, that you were brought up, your religion, everything, your whole identity for the identity of the people of your in-laws? And this is what Ruth did. This isn't a, a small act of faith that she did. What she did was, was just tremendous. Um, and so our text this morning, Ruth chapter 3, Starting in verse 7 through 11, and when Boaz had eaten and drunk and had his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she, speaking of Ruth, came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled, turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men whether poor or rich and now my daughter do not fear i will do for you all that you ask for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman this is the word of the lord shall we give thanks this morning father we thank you for your word this morning god we thank you that it is anointed by you breathed out by you Lord, it is profitable for us, and we pray that, Lord, we would apply it to our, our hearts, to our lives. As we look at this example of, of faith, that, Lord, we would follow. Lord, I pray that you would anoint me. May your words come out of my mouth. Lord, I pray that you would just be in our service this morning. Speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things that, as believers, we have to understand is that we're called... To be countercultural. This world is not our home. We have to understand that. This is, where, this is why there's a tension between us and the world. Is that this world isn't our home. This culture isn't our culture. It's not the kingdom culture. Uh, and God has called us to be uh, counterculture. He has called us to go against the grain of culture. Faith will enable you to live counter to the perverse culture of our day. The story of Ruth is really a story of a woman who went against the grain of her culture and identified with the people of God. This is important, and I think it's a timely thing that we have to understand is that we are called to live counter to our culture. If you were at, in Facebook or in the Internet this past week, uh, you are well aware of uh, a speech that was made by the kicker of the Kansas City Chiefs at a Catholic college the commencement and was ridiculed um, was just character assassination Uh, in his speech he uh, spoke up for the unborn he criticized the the pride and a whole month in which we celebrate the perverseness of that pride he His message was one of embracing motherhood, celebrating motherhood, not telling women to get in the kitchen, as some have made his speech to seem, and to embrace and to celebrate masculinity. 
His whole speech ran counterculture because we live in a culture that loves killing babies. One of the candidates, independent candidate, came out a couple weeks ago saying that he fully supports abortion to full term. The murder of babies in our nation is just is appalling. We have a whole month that celebrates the pride of perverseness. That's our culture. Our culture wants to downplay masculinity and, in fact, to make men less than men, to confuse them, to think that they're boys, the boys are actually girls, and to downplay motherhood, what it means to be a woman. And as a result, he was criticized for it. Now, compare that, or contrast that, I should say, to his teammate, Travis Kelsey, who, upon his graduation, chugged a can of beer, looked like a buffoon. And in fact, in a podcast, he encouraged the graduates to party. And he was celebrated. That's our culture. You see, when we take up the cross of Christ... It is a death to ourself, a death to our culture, and we are to live counter to that. And this message from Ruth and what we learn from her really is timely for the time in which we live. Here's a little backstory on Ruth. The story of Ruth occurs during the time of the judges. This is a time of, of uh, just chaos. Uh, the people of Israel would be ruled by judges, not by a king and a deliverer, and they would be doing great in in serving God and being faithful to God, but there comes a time when they started wandering away from God, and they rejected God, and then they would begin to embrace the culture of the day, of the nations around them, the religions of the, the nations around them, and they would begin to serve other gods, and God's anger would be kindled against them, and to bring them to repentance, he would allow their enemies to uh, take advantage of them all in an attempt to bring them back to repentance, which that's what would happen. They would be subjected, oppressed by the the Philistines and other nations around them. And then they would cry out to God and God would raise up a deliverer. He would raise up a judge and that they would give victory to the people and, and then they would serve God. And that was kind of the cycle of the book of Judges. And so Ruth is taking place during that period of time. And during this time, a famine had occurred in the land, and Elimelech, that's Naomi's husband, and, and Naomi, that's, that's the in-laws to Ruth, uh, and their two sons left Bethlehem, and they went to Moab, of all places. Um, they, they left the promised land and trusting in God, and they went to Moab. And Moab was a, a nation that was so perverse and so ungodly that many commentators, uh, their eyebrows, theologians' eyebrows kind of raised that here this family would leave Israel, would leave Bethlehem, would leave the promised land uh, and go to such a perverse area. But while there, the two sons married local Moabite women, which again would raise eyebrows. Eventually, the husbands of both of these sons, the the husband and both of these sons, I should say, uh, passed away and they died. Naomi then discovered that the famine back home in Bethlehem was over. And so with her, both of her daughter-in-laws, she sets back home to Bethlehem. And as she was going, Naomi instructs both ladies to return home and to essentially find love again. She's like, you guys are young and beautiful, right? Go back to your families, go back to your people, and you will definitely find somebody who will marry you and you can have a family and, and this difficult time in your life will, will, uh, will, will kind of just disappear as you seek love and, and continue your life back home. Orpa, one of her daughter-in-laws, um, <clears throat> followed Naomi's in, uh, instructions and advice and she leaves. But Ruth stays. And she goes against the cultural norm. She goes against everything that you would have expected. What Orpah did, yes, you know, she was following. No, we don't want to go. But when pressed, she did what anybody of us would have done in that situation, right? You're going to go back home. You're going to go to what is normal and, and what you're comfortable with. But yet Ruth says, no, wherever you go, she tells Naomi, I'm going to go. 
In fact, your people are my people. Your God is my God. Isn't that amazing? I don't know how Naomi and Elimelech, how they uh, revered God or their testimony before God, but something in their worship of God must have spoke to Ruth, that Ruth said, you know what, I'm going to turn my back on all the gods that I grew up with and the culture that I know to embrace a new culture, a new identity to a people who are not my people but will be my people. This is no small gesture. She refuses to be identified with her people and with their gods. Much like Moses who refused to identify with being Pharaoh, the, daughter of, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but I'd rather identify with the people of God, Ruth is identifying with the people of God. Long story short, Ruth is working in the fields and gleaning from whatever is left over from the harvesters. What Naomi was telling her daughter-in-laws to do was in their best interest. Go back home. Find love. A guy that will take care of you. Because life as a widow was difficult. It was lonely. They come back to Bethlehem and Naomi is older. Ruth is having to go out and glean from the fields, from the harvesters, what, what they didn't pick up. And so she was, this was hard work. It wasn't easy. All in an attempt to serve and to be a blessing to her mother-in-law. She finds herself gleaning in the fields of all people a relative of her in-laws, a man by the name of Boaz. Aren't you glad that that's how God works? You know, for many people, this is just a coincidence. It just so happened that the fields that, of all the fields, this was the one. But we know that it was the Spirit of God directing her. Naomi gives Ruth instructions because she realizes that Boaz is showing interest in Ruth. In fact, if you read the the text before, Boaz tells the harvesters, leave even more grain, leave even more stuff behind so that she doesn't have to work so hard, so that she can glean even more and be able to be a a bigger blessing to her mother-in-law. Naomi, an older, wiser woman, recognizes that Boaz isn't doing this just because he's a good guy, which I'm sure he was. But come on, guys, we, we, we are good guys. We're kind. But when a girl catches our attention, we're going to show extra kindness. And that's what Boaz did. He was showing extra kindness. Ruth didn't pick up on it. Naomi did, and Naomi instructs Ruth on what she is to do. And this is where we pick up in our text. And I want us to focus on verse 11. Boaz is talking to Ruth, and he says, And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you and all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. This word, word worthy is, means strong, capable, valor, virtuous. In fact, in the King James, that's the word that uh, the, the translators used in this text is virtuous. I'm reminded of Proverbs 31 in reading of Ruth's story. And maybe, maybe the writer of Proverbs 31 had Ruth in mind when he wrote that powerful chapter. Verse 31 of Proverbs, verse 10, it says, An excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. That word worthy in Ruth 3.11 is the same word in Proverbs 31.10 for excellent. An excellent, a worthy, capable, strong woman. Wife who can find, right? I want us to look at three aspects of Ruth's virtue this morning or aspects of her faith. Right? I'm using the word virtue, but it's also aspects of her faith. And the first virtue was that was demonstrated through her conduct. Her first act of virtue of, of her faith was in her conduct. Ruth conducted herself in such a manner that others took notice. Ruth is the outsider in a small town. People are watching this Gentile woman, this Moabite woman of all people, under a microscope. We live in a small town. Right. I lived I grew up in a small town. My brothers and and I would go ride our bikes and, you know, maybe we did something that we weren't supposed to. I can't remember. But I do remember getting by the time I got home, my parents knew where we were and what we were doing. And sometimes it wasn't 
what we should have been doing. But then you're wondering, like, how did they know? You live in a small town, word travels, right? The same is true here in Bethlehem. Here it was a small town. And this wasn't just anybody. Everybody remembered Naomi and her husband and her two sons as they left to get away from the famine. And now they returned. Well, just Naomi and this other woman, this Moabite woman. Everybody was looking at her under a microscope. Have you ever felt like that? Go into a restaurant that maybe is not that crowded and everybody turns. And you just want to be like, hey, guys, you know, were you waiting for me? Because they just all look and instinctively we look. They were looking, they were watching. If there had been anything in her conduct that was inconsistent with her virtue, it would have been on display for everybody to see. And what does Boaz declare in verse 11? For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman, a virtuous woman, a capable woman, a strong woman. Verse 10 sheds some light on how the townspeople came to this conclusion. It says, you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. This speaks of her conduct. She wasn't behaving uncomely. She wasn't uh, acting without discretion. Right. There was wisdom and there was elegance with the way that she carried herself. The second thing that we see is Ruth's virtue, her faith was apparent in her obedience. Ruth listened to the wisdom of Naomi and obeyed her mother in law. It's hard to obey your own mom, let alone your mother in law. Right. Remember when you were kids and your teacher tried to tell you what to do, and, and maybe you thought you were a little bit more stronger in what you thought. You're not my mom. And in those days, when the teacher, you said that to the teacher, the teacher then called your mom, and then you realized, ouch, if I disobey my teacher, I'm disobeying my mom. If I said that to my teacher, it's as if I was saying it to my mom, and um, maybe you were like me, your parents laid hands on you. My parents believed in laying on of hands and the belt and the wooden spoon. <laughs> But to listen to your mother-in-law shows her faith, her confidence and her trust in that what Naomi was saying was for her own benefit, for her own good. And instead of her pride getting in the way, she humbled herself and recognized that her mother-in-law truly had her best interest at heart and her faith was on display through her obedience. Our faith is on display through our obedience. When the Lord speaks to us and He tells us to do something, Our faith is on display whether we act upon that or whether we don't. Ruth didn't assert her will or demand her rights. Ruth humbled herself and did exactly what Naomi said. And as a result, God rewarded her greatly for it. The third thing that we see with Ruth's virtue or her faith is that it led to a great blessing. The same is true for you and I. Our faith will lead to a great blessing. Our faith will lead us safely home in the arms of Christ. You see, this example, this story of Ruth and Boaz is really an example or a type of our relationship with Christ. Jesus, uh, Boaz being a type of Christ, that that redeeming uh, relative that redeemed them back. Ruth being on the outside of, of faith, right? The Gentile coming into the arms of Boaz. Her faith led her into that great blessing, into his arms. And our faith will lead us into the very arms of God. If you know the story, if you read on, Ruth follows what Naomi says. And and there is one little little moment where, you know, all this this planning could have went awry because there was another relative that was a little closer that could have redeemed them. And Boaz, in his wisdom, presented this to him in such a way that it didn't look all that appealing because a part of redeeming this family is then you'd have to take Ruth as your wife. And this guy didn't want Ruth as his wife. And so Boaz said, well, then I will be the one who will redeem because he was wanting to redeem not only Naomi and her family, but Ruth. And Ruth and Boaz become husband and wife. And if that's all that the story was, was just that, what a beautiful story. Right, ladies? What a beautiful love story. But it gets even better. 
Ruth and Boaz had a son named Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Now, Jesse was the father of a certain young man named David, who from the sheep pen, God called him to be the shepherd of Israel, to be king. And from David, God promised that his line would have a, an eternal dynasty, that through him there would be one that would be the Messiah. Now, think about this. Ruth is right there in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus. This Moabite woman, this woman who, when she grew up, didn't even know God. She was serving all types of gods and pagan rituals and all of this. And her life changed when she agreed to marry this one man. And she was able to see what faith looked like with Naomi and Elimelech. And when the push comes to shove, she turns her back on her culture, turns her back on her people, on all the false gods, and she embraced the identity of the people of God. Her faith rewarded her, not just with a husband through Boaz, but that through her, King David was born. And from King David, the Lord Jesus. Listen, our faith will be demonstrated for future generations. The life that you're living for Christ, your children, your grandchildren, and not only your physical, natural children, but the children that call Parkview home. You are giving an example of your faith to them that they're watching. When we're, when we're singing our songs, how you worship, they're watching. The conversations that we have after church, they're listening. You're thinking, no, they're just out there playing. No, 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 they're listening. They're watching. You're being an example. You're passing down the faith and it's being demonstrated for future generations. And there will come a moment in their young lives when, when maybe they're, they're, there's a difficult situation, maybe a, a, a challenging uh, dilemma that they're in, and something that you said, something that you did in, in your discipleship of the Lord before them, that they will be drawn back to and will be able to intercede for themselves because of the example you have set for them. What you do now will affect future generations. I'm sure Ruth, when she was living her life, would have never thought that there would be a group of people in northwest Iowa, because at that time, northwest Iowa didn't exist. The land did, but not the state boundary lines, right? You understand what I'm getting at? Um, at that time, she would have never thought of that there's a continent on the other side of the, of the world, that there would be a group of people that would read about her story. It would be like if I told you, hey, guess what? What you're doing now, it's going to be recorded. In about 3,000 years, there's going to be a group of people that's going to read about your life. And you would look at me like you're looking at me like, no, whatever, that ain't going to happen. Who am I that somebody would want to read about my life? What Ruth didn't realize was her life was being recorded for future generations. What we don't realize is our life is being recorded for future generations. Now, it's not going to be in a sacred book like the Bible, but it is re being recorded in the hearts and the minds of those around us, the people that are sitting in front of you or behind you, not just our children, but, but our peers. Your life is inspiring them to persevere. The things that you go through, how you handle that, your faith is on display, not just for those here in this room, but those outside of this room, those that you work with, those that you associate with, they see you, they see your life, how you're dealing with all the stress and the pressures of, of our culture and the current day situations that we face. And it's on display. And it will be handed down. Your godliness, your, vir your virtue will have a ripple effect to all those around you. It's kind of like what we talked about last week with Jochebed, that wonderful woman, mighty in faith, was able to do courageous things in saving the life of her son. The same is true with Ruth and the, and the lessons that we learn that the, our godliness and our virtue will have a ripple effect 
Something took place in young Moses' life after having those formative years with his mother that he rejected all the pleasures of sin that Egypt had to offer. And he rather identified with the sufferings of the people of God. Here, Ruth, an in-law, saw something in Naomi that triggered faith within her. And the ripple effect that we see not only through her son, but her grandson and even for us today. Your life, your faith has a ripple effect. Your children, your grandchildren, pass down that godly legacy to them. Like we talked about last week, if, if you say, man, I haven't really started, start now. The Lord can redeem the years that the locusts have eaten. Don't you have the excuse like, well, it's too late. It's never too late. Well, my kids are all adults. That's okay. You can still give that legacy to them even as adults because God can do great and glorious things. And then look at the youth and the children that come to church. Some of them don't have any other church background. Their parents don't come. They come because we bring them. They come because they, they, they walk in here and they feel the presence of God. I've heard multiple kids that come on Wednesday nights come because this church is a welcoming church and they feel the love of Christ. They list some churches that they've been to that they didn't feel that. I hope nobody in the schools, well, those kids say that Parkview is a bunch of cranky old people that don't want anybody because that's what they said about some other churches. But they say that we come here because they feel God's love. They just, there's just, it's just a good feeling here. That's passing down that legacy. As we close, Ruth's faith didn't just bless her and her family in her lifetime just by marrying Boaz. But her faith had a long-term implication as she became an essential part of the genealogy of the Lord Jesus. This Gentile woman who made a declaration of faith by identifying with Naomi's people and, and to Naomi's God was brought into the household of faith. Ruth lived a countercultural life, rejecting the cultural norms of her pagan society to follow the Hebrew God. Ruth went against the cultural norms of feeling great pressure to marry just anyone, but she waited patiently on the, on the Lord. And we're called to live counterculture as ambassadors of Christ. Our, our culture doesn't dictate what we believe or how we conduct ourselves. Our culture says, look out for number one. Our, our, and the kingdom culture says to give of ourselves. Our culture loves violence and hate. The kingdom culture calls us to be peacemakers and to love. Our culture says, get all that you can while you can because YOLO, you only live once. Kingdom culture says, give all that you can because there's a life that's much bigger and greater than the life that we have now. We don't just live once. We can live twice, the second resurrection the Word of God declares that we, what we believe and how we're to conduct ourselves, even if the world tries to ca- cancel us, even if they try to assassinate our character, let them say what they want. Let them do what they want. We will stand firm in our faith to the Lord Jesus. And just as the townspeople took notice of Ruth's faith, the world around us will take notice as well. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for this wonderful example of faith living counterculture, rejecting everything that would be the cultural norm for, for Ruth. Lord, we are also given that same opportunity. We can embrace the culture that we're accustomed to, or we can identify with the people of God. Lord, I pray that we would follow Ruth's example that she shunned and turned her back on her culture, turned her back on the pagan gods. She died to herself, and she was embraced in the people of God. Lord, we stand at a moment in our lives, in our culture, that, that when we shun our culture, may we live counter to it, to its perversion and to its greed. Lord, may we embrace you. May we identify with you. And with the people of God. And even if that means suffering. Even if that means ridicule. Even if that means a a, a loss of our reputation. Whatever it costs. May our faith be embedded in the Lord Jesus. 
And may nothing shake us or rattle us. Lord, we put our faith in you, that solid rock, in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen and amen.